This is the first laptop I bought for myself, the Acer Aspire 5735Z model MS2253. I purchased it in 2009 from the local Best Buy for a total of around $400 which I split with my parents. I paid off the rest by working around the house for the next few summers, mostly doing yard work and planting trees. As a freshman in high school, I was ready to upgrade for my aging hand-me-down IBM ThinkPad, yes, IBM ThinkPad, running Windows 95. Since then, it has passed through my family and, when my brother only recently upgraded, finally back to me. I am very interested to see if this laptop still has any utility now in 2020, a decade and a bit later, and of course, I want to see if we can play any games. But first, let's get this cleaned off, starting with the well-worn blue gradient shell. The 5735Z shipped with an Intel Pentium dual-core processor, clocked at 2.0 GHz, sporting Intel HD 4500 mobile graphics. My model has 2GB of DDR2 RAM, and it all drives a 1366 by 768 screen, which was quite a nice resolution for the time. The 16 by 9 aspect ratio was just gaining steam, and widescreen was all the rage. But let's get this ancient beast opened up and feast our eyes on early 2009's most advanced operating system, Windows Vista. Wow, that power button really requires some effort. I hope that won't be a problem later. among you viewers will notice that this doesn't quite look like the Windows Vista you might be familiar with. That's right, because before I handed this off to my brother, I installed Ubuntu on it in an effort to give him a smoother experience on this low-end hardware. The fact that even in around 2012 I was already looking for a software solution to the slow hardware does not bode well for my attempt to modernize this computer today, let alone to game on it. We can confirm that this laptop is indeed running the dual-core Pentium T3200 processor. This is based on the same Marome architecture as the Core 2 Duo of the same era, and was released in roughly 2006 to 2007. Compared to the Core 2 Duo, this processor runs only 100 MHz slower, but with half the cache and a much slower front-side bus clock, it is limited even by the standards of the day. Although Firefox loads just fine, it's so old that it does not even support HTML5 video. Rather than upgrading all the software on this machine and trying to make it work though, we will try to upgrade this laptop to a fresh install of Windows 10. We will start by opening up the back of the computer and seeing what we have to work with. After removing the battery, we can unscrew the six screws securing the access compartment to the rear of the laptop. Once all six screws are removed, we can apply a little pressure to pop off the back door, giving us easy access to the internals of the computer. Inside, we can see the RAM slots, the upgradable Wi-Fi card, the CPU assembly, and the 160GB internal hard drive mounted underneath this bracket. Let's get that removed by unscrewing three screws holding it and the metal holding bracket into the frame of the laptop, and then gently pushing out of its SATA connector. This Hitachi 2.5-inch SATA 3 model drive has a capacity of 160GB and spins at 5400 RPM. Fairly average for 2009, but today, in 2020, we can certainly do better. Let's begin with the solid state drive upgrade. We will be replacing the Hitachi 160GB drive with this PNY CS600 240GB solid state drive that used to be the primary drive in one of my gaming rigs. It is the exact same size as the 2.5 inch hard drive we pulled out and clicks neatly into the SATA port already in the laptop. The hold down bracket then mounts back into it with the three screws we removed earlier. Before going any further, I'm curious if this will now just boot right into the Windows installation that's already on this drive. Let's click the back plate back into place, but we won't have to do up all of the screws just yet as I anticipate coming right back to the insides shortly. We carefully flip the laptop back over, reconnect it to power, and press that power button. Hmm, let's try that again. Let's power this back up. Let's power this back up. Remember when I brushed off the power button issues earlier? 
It seems that this is the real root cause of the issue, so that's something that we will have to repair. We start by flipping the computer back over and removing all 14 screws around the base of the laptop frame. Once all the screws are out, we can start by using a pry tool to open the frame of the laptop, working our way around the sides and undoing the clips one by one. There's still a lot of resistance here. It seems like inside the shell there's another clip or another screw that I just can't get at. So let's do something I should have done in the first place. Absolutely without using Acer's disassembly manual, I've come to the independent conclusion that the power button can be easily accessed by removing the middle cover using only my pry tool. Once this is removed, we can easily see the daughter board that houses all the buttons and the LED indicator lights, and there, in this hole, is the troublesome power button. And success! This installation is bloated with programs and drivers that are appropriate with a modern gaming PC, and bringing this poor Aspire to a crawl. So while I'm astounded that it booted right in, it is time to shut this down again and get a fresh copy of Windows 10 installed. By pressing F2 on the boot screen, that little buzzer beeps once to know that we are in the BIOS. From here, we can poke around in the extremely limited BIOS. I wonder if I can overclock. <laughs> No, we cannot. We set the flash drive as our boot device and get into the Windows setup screen. From here, we can install Windows 10 just like we would on any other machine, although we can already tell the little Pentium is struggling as it slowly unpacks all the installation files. Windows installation does take a little while, but eventually, here we are. A fresh Windows 10 connected to the internet with all of its updates installed. So how is this laptop to use now then with a fresh installation of Windows 10? Well, not too great, to be honest. We can see that RAM isn't really an issue with the surprisingly well-optimized Windows 10 running with only about one gigabyte in use. The drive isn't really being hit that hard either, so it's easy to tell that the processor is our bottleneck. But even an older computer can still be usable for light entertainment and some productivity, right? Well, YouTube.com takes ages to load with the CPU pegged at 100% trying to render the page in a modern browser. When a video starts to load, the audio will start playing before the video does, and most of the time, these are the ads. It actually renders them unskippable, as the skip button does not load in on screen quickly enough to actually press it before the ad is done. For productivity, I will be using the free Google Docs suite. Loading up the web page is actually surprisingly snappy, a testament to Google's design. With a new document open, we start typing and Wow, what a laggy experience. Just like YouTube though, once it's given a moment to load, it responds well to typing. This could definitely be used in a pinch to draft a resume or other documents. I'm very glad to see that there is a use to this after all. Now let's try to improve our performance by decluttering Windows 10. First, we will go into the Windows appearance settings and disable all of Windows 10's nice pretty features like transparency and window animations. This does not impact the usability of the operating system dramatically at all, but it definitely speeds up the responsiveness on the system on low-end hardware. Next, we'll go into the programs and features and uninstall everything that Windows will let us, barring some other essential applications like the Synaptics trackpad driver. Finally, we will take the drastic option and disable Windows Defender completely. Now we do actually see a slight reduction in RAM usage as well, and a reduction in that VRAM usage. In fact, the whole system is now using less than 800 megabytes of RAM. Good job, Windows. I'm actually quite impressed. But will this actually make a difference? Well, yes and no. The system feels much better when working around the operating system, just opening and closing windows and launching applications. YouTube, though, is still a difficult beast. No matter how much we can shave from running in the background, the poor Pentium T3200 still has trouble rendering the page. It does improve the issue of ad playback starting too soon and being unskippable, though. All in all, with the responsiveness improvements, this little computer is definitely usable for productivity and light entertainment if you have a little patience. Now for the big question though, can it game?
Well, look at this. I'm absolutely blown away by how well this old laptop can handle a modern multiplayer title like Destiny 2. It is only running at 1366 by 768 resolution, but it is doing it extremely capably at well over 60 FPS. Quite an achievement for a graphics chip that had trouble decoding a simple YouTube video. I'm able to play the new Seraph Tower public event without too much trouble, but if I listen closely, there is quite the loud fan noise, and there seems to be some small, strange input lag on the mouse as well. Just kidding. This is running on my gaming rig across the room, playing on this old laptop via Steam Remote Play. While I am indeed impressed by how smoothly the laptop handled the streaming and decoding, it's far from a fair answer to the question, can it game? In fact, you might be inclined to say it's cheating. So let's say we stop cheating and see what it can actually do. Unfortunately, not much. 2008's flagship RTS title Company of Heroes takes a while to launch, and while pre-rendered cutscenes run just fine, once things get in-engine, the frame rate drops to low single digits, and there are dramatic rendering errors. Most models didn't actually load it at all, leaving me ordering blank UI elements around an empty battlefield. Absolutely unplayable. Things don't get better for other high-end titles of the era either. Supreme Commander won't even launch, and even if it could, I doubt their frame rates will be anything to write home about. Valve's original Portal was released in 2007, two years before this laptop came out, but even running in DirectX 9 mode, with all settings set to their lowest values, the game struggles mightily to be remotely playable even at 1280 by 720 resolution. As a side note though, I just loaded one of my portal saves from 2010 using Steam's cloud save feature and jumped right back in like nothing happened. How cool is that? And this particular experience is a little eye-opening for me, as this happens to be the exact laptop that I played Portal on originally. My own standards for playable have changed immensely. Back then I was happy with this choppy experience because I was just happy to be playing the game. And now I poo-poo anything that's not a smooth 60 FPS. I suppose I've been spoiled. I do have to be fair to this laptop though, these games were known at the time for being graphically intensive. So what about some lighter or independent titles? Command & Conquer Red Alert 3 launches just fine and plays well at lower 800x600 resolutions on low, but anything higher becomes unplayable quickly. Fortunately, this computer has no problem playing its cutscenes. It would be a shame if I couldn't bask in George Takei's impeccable performance in this game. Bastion and Fez were both released in the independent game's renaissance of around 2012, just a couple years newer than this PC. Neither of them, however, will launch. Bastion errors out because the graphics chip will not support OpenGL 2.1, and Fez crashes from Steam to desktop without any warning whatsoever. Clearly, the lack of support from this Intel GMA 4500 MHD graphics chipset for even semi-modern APIs is the limiting factor here. So let's run 3 Mark and see how it measures up. The benchmark software makes it clear that we are greatly limited. Firestrike is unavailable to us because our graphics chipset does not support DirectX 11. So our only option is 3 Mark CloudGate, a benchmark for basic laptops with integrated graphics. But once that benchmark loads up, I am once again surprised by the fact that it's able to render anything at all. Sure, it's choppy, but it's... Oh, that was the demo. Oh, no! Once it actually loads into the graphics tests, it completely fails the first with a white screen and barely manages the second. Hey though, at least I'm not last. Fortunately, there are some of my other favorite games that do play passably well. The first computer game I ever really played is Pocket Tanks, a game released in 2001 by Michael P. Welch that was adapted from his earlier Amiga hit. I'm not really surprised that this runs like a dream considering its 233 MHz and DirectX 3 minimum requirements, but it is a joy to relive some of this nostalgic one-on-one -on -one action. My brothers would play this for hours and hours, and we would swap out when one of us lost, and I brought the free shareware version into school where my friends and I would waste even more time in computer class when the teacher wasn't looking. Then there is Stronghold Crusader, another game that my brothers and I played religiously as kids. I am playing the HD remaster available on GOG.com, and it still looks great. 
You can start to see some hiccups though as the action gets a little more intense while zoomed out, even on this simple first campaign mission. It is playable though, and it's gratifying to see my RTS muscle memory return to this game, even if I did mess up my initial build. Glad this first mission is generous with resources. And finally, there is Minecraft. The first public alpha was released in 2009 and ran in Java, but that's not the version we were running today. This is the Windows 10 version, available on the Microsoft Store, but it still runs great with some graphical tweaking. I turned all the fancy settings off and reduced the render distance to five chunks, which made the game very playable, though didn't say anything for my own Minecraft skills. There is one last thing I want to check though, some more game streaming options. Although Steam Remote Play works well enough, you still have to have a beefy gaming PC somewhere in your house. With another service like GeForce Now though, all you need is an internet connection to play AAA modern games. It stands to reason that with Steam's success, GeForce Now would also work, right? Unfortunately though, this is not the case. Although we barely meet the minimum processor requirements, GeForce Now requires at least 4GB of RAM to run. Unfortunately, I don't have any DDR2 laptop memory lying around to try out. I have ordered some for $10 on eBay though, and when it comes in, I might make a follow-up video to see if it can game on GeForce Now once it meets those minimum specs. I hope you have enjoyed this retrospective dive into the first laptop I ever purchased. I certainly enjoyed pulling it back out. If you liked this video, hit that like button and get subscribed. I have a couple more tech videos in the pipeline coming soon for you to check out. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.